Good afternoon and welcome to the police practices group. This is the subcommittee subcommittee meeting on policing and mental health, uh, a portion or a subgroup of the full committee. My name is Jim Schwartz. I'm with the county manager's office. Um, before I turn it over to the subgroup chair, uh, let me just remind everybody that while this meeting is being broadcast this afternoon on a number of different outlets, uh, so that you can hear the dialogue, the presentations. We're not taking comments this afternoon, but you can always give us feedback on the county's website, going to the police practices page. You will find a feedback form there. You can select any of the areas that the group is working on, any or all of them. Uh, come up with your questions, your comments, your feedback. All of them are being read. Uh, the staff for the committee is going through all of that work. Uh, and we welcome your comments at any time. Today's uh, discussion, as I said before, is by the Subcommittee on Policing and Mental Health. And I'm gonna turn it over now to the chair of that subgroup, Naomi Vertigo. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Um, I'm the chair of the Mental Health Subcommittee of the Police Practices Group. And last week we heard sort of um, the big national picture from Judge Steve Leifman and from Treatment Advocacy Center. This week, we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. It's responding, actual responses to psychiatric crisis calls. We're really fortunate to have with us today two experts in this field. One is Joe Smarrow from the San Antonio Police Department. He is from New York originally, uh, in, went into the Marines when he was, I believe, 17, and uh, joined the San Antonio Police Department in October 2005, where he was one of the original members of their um, mental health unit. Uh, I have seen so much on that. I've kind of been stalking you, Joe, but uh, I've seen your TED Talk and um, very impressive how this mental health unit works. So Joe has been with them for 10 years. He's also um, the co-founder and CEO of Solution Point, which is a consulting and training firm specializing in mental health, employee and organizational wellness, and crisis intervention for law enforcement. And what really got my attention about him is he's the subject of an HBO documentary called Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, which premiered at South by Southwest in 2019. We also have with us Tim Black from Cahoots, which is an Oregon non-police model for responding to psychiatric crisis calls and homelessness and substance abuse. Um, it's been in, uh, in uh, effect for over 30 years. Tim has been with them since 2010, so he celebrates his 10-year anniversary. He has a bachelor's in fine arts, but then took it upon himself to get into um, serving others through CAHOOTS, which stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. And we'll hear more about that model from him. Uh, he became program manager of it in 2015 and uh, director of consulting um, recently. So, um, Let's see, we have a clip from Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, and we're gonna run that now before we start in with our speakers. But thank you both for being here. I'm gonna head over code one, and that's gonna be all with them. I'm being told that she is gonna be on that bridge. Where's she at? She's sitting on the rail here. No one calls us to give us good news. They call us because something bad is happening, and so they're in a crisis. Are you okay? We just have a saying in law enforcement, ask, tell, make. I'm gonna ask you to do it, I'm gonna tell you to do it, and I'm gonna make you do it. On average, in a police academy in this country, they spend 60 hours or more learning how to shoot a gun, and they spend eight on mental health and communication. We need to shift that. He is now feeling suicidal and homicidal. Your mom said that you haven't been on medication. They found Mel who was trying to commit suicide. Are you hearing voices right now? Yes. What are they saying to you? No! No! Has anyone here, while you're at a work capacity, told someone, I'm scared? 
As human beings, we have to be connected. I unplug a lamp, it don't work. Are you okay? I promise you I can help you. You might be broken, but you're fixable. If it takes me all day long to convince them that we're not gonna hurt them and they're gonna come with us. How you doing? You okay? I'll take all day long. Oh, no, no, this is my partner, Joe. My name's Ernie. So if you haven't seen Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, I encourage you to watch it. One thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to Joe Smaro is he prides himself on having a clean track record with zero use of force incidents. Interesting, and we're going to want to hear more about that. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, like like uh, Naomi said, my name is Joe Smaro, and I've been with the San Antonio Police Department for the last 15 years, and the last 11 of those, I just hit 11 years on the on the mental health unit there, and it has been an incredibly rewarding experience for me. But just a little history and context. So, uh, as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, crisis intervention training has been around since 1987, 1988, and it started in Memphis. And so, uh, there's nothing new about introducing the concept of CIT into law enforcement, yet a vast majority of police departments in this country still do not have it. Uh, there, there's nothing standardized about the idea of training police or first responders on how to properly deal with people in a mental health crisis. And so San Antonio has been receiving the 40 hour training since 2002, 2003 is when uh, we started getting the training in our department. And then the full-time mental health unit didn't start until 2008. And so it still was quite some time. Like the Memphis model suggests, you know, they believe with CIT International or this Memphis model that CIT is not for everybody. It should only be for, you know, 10 to 20% of every agency and uh, reserved for officers that want to do this type of work. I've always struggled with that. And I don't know everyone on the call, and I don't say this to be offensive, but I'm just going to be honest and transparent. The reason I've always had a problem with that is because, you know, San Antonio, Chief McManus was one of the first uh, police chiefs. In fact, he was provided an award for this, but he was one of the, the first uh, police chiefs of a major city to mandate that 100% of the department was going to go through 40 hours of CIT training. And now we give it to every cadet class. And so before our officers even graduate the academy or hit the streets, they have to go through 40 hours of CIT. But my issue with this idea that it should only be reserved for 10 to 10 to 20 percent of every agency is in law enforcement. Unless or until you have the ability to pick and choose the calls you respond to, you shouldn't have the ability to pick and choose how trained you are. And whether we agree with it or don't agree with it, you could say conservatively 10 percent of every 911 call is somebody suffering from a mental health crisis. I've seen statistics that support up to 50% or 30%. And so while the numbers are all over the place, what I know from experience living in the seventh largest city in the country on a large, uh, a major police department of 2,400 officers is two things. One, regardless of what the actual numbers are on mental health calls, whether it's 10%, 20%, 33%, it doesn't matter. I've seen all kinds of ones. What I do know is just like I said in that movie, you know, people don't call the police when things are going well. They don't call us to celebrate us, to congratulate us when things are, you know, uh, when, when everything is happening the right way. They call us when something's wrong. And so that in and of itself supports this idea that maybe the reason someone is calling the police or the, the people that are having the police called on them is because somebody is suffering some level of emotional distress on some level. Now, you might not have a mental illness, but you absolutely are going through some type of emotional disturbance. Because again, if not, if you were able to handle the situation on your own, if you were able to resolve the conflict within your family, within your neighborhood, within your community by yourself, then law enforcement wouldn't be called. And so I don't like the idea that there's some agencies that don't feel that everybody should have to respond to these, or are, I'm sorry, should have to be trained. 
Now, uh, I love the idea that this is happening. The fact that you have me talking about how it looks and how it works from the police department side. And then we have Tim coming to talk about the cahoots side of it, where it's non-law enforcement response. And so you basically have those three tiers. You have a police only type of response you that are trained in CIT preferably. Then you have a co-responder model where you have law enforcement paired up with a licensed clinician responding to these calls. And then you have programs like Cahoots where it's uh, just non-law enforcement personnel responding to these calls. And so if you break them down into those three silos, again, you can determine. I think, you know, for me personally, I think the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle because what I do accept is that not every police officer thinks like I do. Uh, I'll tell you that the reason I've lasted as long as I have in this profession is because I found the mental health unit, because I've been able to stay on the unit, because for me, we're not really doing police work. I'm truly, uh, we get to dress in plain clothes, we drive unmarked cars, and so we look like civilians responding to people. So I'll tell you a little bit about the unit, again, how we're formed, what it looks like, how we operate, and then uh, that might be my time for this portion and then be happy to answer questions after Tim. So as of right now, we have 16 people on our unit. So we have 10 patrol officers, two detectives, one supervisor, and then we have three civilian clinicians assigned to the unit. And so while we are not a co-responder model, because the clinicians don't ride with us, we are paired up. So we're, we're doubled up in a vehicle. So it's two officers in a car, in an unmarked car, driving to every call. But we have access to these clinicians that we can either call out to the scene with us or how we really use them is for case management. And so if we have somebody that we think needs a higher level of care or they need wraparound services post-discharge after we get them to the hospital for treatment, then we'll let the clinicians know and then they'll follow up with them and they just kind of act on a case management role. All 10 of us on the unit on the patrol side are, again, plain clothes. It's a huge part of it because it's, a, it's the first step in de-escalation and we're all trained in the 40 hour crisis intervention but we're not a full-time 24 7 unit because there's not there's just not enough of us i mean in a city of almost 2 million people uh, a unit of 10 or 16 depending on how you look at it isn't going to even come close to addressing the the need that exists within the city but that's why all of our officers are trained every one of the cadets and then every one of the patrol officers so in san antonio any 911 call that police are showing up to, they've been through CIT training, 40 hours of CIT training. And so there's no excuse of ignorance of I didn't know or I don't know how to de-escalate someone in a crisis or I don't know how to you know, use active listening to, to build rapport with people because every one of our officers have, have been through the training. Now, obviously that doesn't mean it's perfect and we're dealing with imperfect people on every level. And so, yeah, there's there's absolutely going to be issues with that with that system but our unit and again you know i pride myself personally on going 11 years of dealing with some very very sick people people with firearms people with knives jumpers i mean all levels of crisis and not having to use force which to me is always like i mean it's not funny but when i hear other officers you know with all the talk going on this year and people talking about removing the ability for police to respond to mental health calls it, it, it cracks me up because the it's like hypocrisy in law enforcement because a lot of police officers complain about having to deal with so many mental health calls. It's like all my calls are, are mental health related. All I do is respond to mental health calls now. And then you hear someone talking about like, okay, well, we're gonna remove those and give it to some other city uh, based unit. And they're like offended or appalled by it. And like, oh yeah, well, let's see how long before one of them get shot or stabbed. And I'm immediately, I'm like, well, how many times have you been shot and stabbed on your mental health calls? And the answer is probably zero. And so, you know, but it's like they take offense to this idea of removing certain portions of the job. Now, here's what I would say about having that type of just harsh uh, reaction of we're just going to eliminate police responding to mental health calls. One, my problem with that idea is you can you can think that or say that or pretend that that's going to be a thing. My fear is that if an agency says, okay, you know, we're going to fund some, we're going to, you know, reallocate money, we're going to build up some, uh, you know, city-based operation that's going to respond to these calls. I think that is going to allow the department to be off the hook of thinking they still need CIT training. 
40 hours minimum of CIT training. And that's a problem because again, CIT training is not just about dealing with the mentally ill. The CIT training when done right, and this is the other problem is that there's so many programs out there that do it wrong that just, they're they're just terrible. Honestly, they're, they're it's, it's atrocious. Some of the training that I've seen where they'll put one underqualified person in front of the room for 40 hours and just read PowerPoint slides. And the entire program is just one person talking at the class, no role plays, no interaction, no collaboration with the stakeholders in the community. And so there's, you know, when, when you, San Antonio has been recognized as the gold standard uh, under President Obama's administration, um, you know, our program really is effective and it's because we rely on collaboration. And so when I've seen other agencies do it so poorly, it's sad because I realize like this is why it gets bad reputation. This is why people don't understand it. And so having a program that works well, it really makes the officer understand themselves better. It makes them understand the importance of like um, um, emotional intelligence. It makes them understand um, the, the need to see yourself in order to connect with other people. And so it, it's far greater than just recognizing mental illness and de-escalating. A good program goes much deeper than that. And so pulling away the responsibility of law enforcement to take those calls, I think would then imply that they don't have to do the training. That's problem one. Problem two is it's such an unrealistic goal. Until we train the communities, until we train the country on, as soon as you see a problem, you call 911, until we change that, police are still going to be called to these situations. And not only that, there's this is a very complex multi-layered issue where legislation's involved. I mean, in Texas, you know, the only people that can do what we call emergency detentions or committals are judges, guardians, and law enforcement. That's it. So if a clinician shows up to a call and they say, okay, hey, look, you told me you're suicidal, come on, I have to take you in for help, and they say no, they can't make them go. They can't They can't like force treatment on them. They can't do anything other than call police. And so they're gonna be called anyway as like a secondary responder um, in order to try and get them convinced into going. And so there's a lot of gaps in this idea that we're just gonna pull it away. But not only that, let's say it's not a mental health call. Let's just say it's like a domestic violence call or somebody stole my car or I just got fired from my job and I'm just flailing emotionally. That's not a mental illness type call, but it's absolutely a call where somebody needs you to show up and have some level of understanding of human behavior and how to connect with people and how to de-escalate those intense emotions. And that's only going to happen through training. And so I hear people say you can't train you can't train the the problems that are in law enforcement. You can't train them to be different. You know, I obviously wholeheartedly disagree. I think, you know, it starts in the academy. We get them while they're learning and fresh, and then there has to be consistency. There has to be ongoing training. There has to be hands-on learning. And finally, just to wrap this all up, is our unit specifically, again, we can self-assign calls. So in our, in our cars, on the computer screen, we're scrolling, we look. Anytime there's a call that says mental health, we just click it, self-assign, we show up. Patrol's never dispatched. We show up, we handle it, and we're done. We move on to the next one. Also, we have city-issued cell phones. So once we make these uh, relationships, we give everybody our phone numbers. And I can't tell you how many times people just call us direct instead of calling 911 because they want us to respond to the call. And that comes with building relationships. We also provide the people that we're helping with enough insight to say, hey, look, just because you're having a bad day, just because you're feeling you know, really depressed or down or, or whatever it is, you don't have to call the police. You know, Maybe we can teach you or we can provide you with resources where you can actually call someone that's not law enforcement to, to come and help you. And so we, we spend time educating people because that's a big part of it is understanding what resources are available in your community. So, you know, and then on top of that, we're a training unit because we do train the entire department every three years, we have to do refresher. And so our department is up to speed on, on training when it comes to CIT and de-escalation. And so it's super important, but um, you know, because we're so small, we really try and deal with like specialized type cases. And then one of the things that I do is for the last two years, all I do is internal work now. So I, I deal with officer wellness. And a big part of being in first responder role is the mental health that is, you know, that affects us internally. And so now a lot of my work is done internally with other officers helping them because they're addicted to alcohol or pills or something and uh, or they're suicidal, struggling with PTSD, whatever it is. And so I get them plugged into services. So anyway, um, that's about 
20 minutes. So I'm going to pause there and pass it over to Tim and take a break. Okay, Tim, over to you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was really interesting. Um, yeah. Tim, uh, we're really glad you're with us. There, are, Besides that CAHOOTS, a lot of people in the community have been very interested in hearing about CAHOOTS, and I know you're going to tell us more about it. Um, I was interested because Eugene and Springfield, Oregon combined are about the exact same size as Arlington, Virginia. So it seems like a model we might be able to replicate um, without too much difficulty. And we're also really glad you're safe from the fire and able to be with us today. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, and yes, it is very exciting to be able to speak to you uh, with clean air in the background. Um, I'd like to start by just giving a little bit of, you know, kind of a history lesson on, on CAHOOTS and our organization, Whiteboard Clinic, so we can kind of all get on the same page about how CAHOOTS got to where we are today and what it is that we do in our community. Um, so CAHOOTS, which as Naomi said, is an acronym. It stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. We're a mobile crisis intervention service that operates Within the public safety system, we're dispatched for our calls for service on the same priority channels as police patrol. Uh, and the teams that you see out in the field are always going to be staffed with one person who's an EMT basic and then a crisis worker. Um, the, the CAHOOTS program has been in operation since the 4th of July on, in 1989. But the, the, really the, uh, the underlying services that, that CAHOOTS offers are really tied connectly to the, the foundation of, of Wiper Clinic as an organization in the winter of 1969, going into 1970. Uh, Eugene and Springfield are on the I-5 corridor. It's a straight shot from Sacramento to Canada, and, and Eugene's somewhere in the middle of all of that. Uh, so in the late 60s, we were seeing a lot of the same uh, kind of social issues that, that were going on in other larger cities like Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco. Uh, the, uh, the general sense within our, our community was that um, the resources for mental health, housing, and addiction were woefully inadequate, and that it was going to take a real significant grassroots effort if we were going to be able to address these issues on any sort of meaningful level. And so our founders really looked to other, you know, other areas to see what was what was going well, and we saw a lot of similarities in philosophy and approaches with what was happening at the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic down in San Francisco. So our founders hopped down to the Bay Area, spent a couple of months actually volunteering in the clinic there on Haight-Ashbury, um, really getting to know the founder and, and a lot of the staff there. And then we took those lessons learned, brought them back up to Eugene and started the Whitebird Clinic Sociomedical Aid Station. Uh, before we even had a brick and mortar location though, we wanted to be able to offer something to our community. And so we had a crisis line that rang into our founder's living room. And as soon as that phone started ringing, we were seeing a lot of different situations where it would just make so much more of a difference. We would have so much more of an impact if we were able to actually go out and physically meet that person where they were at. Uh, you know, there were folks who felt like it was too much for them to manage to f flip through the phone book to find that number to call. Um, and so they were asking if there's an easier way to get a hold of us. Uh, you know, we were just there were just so many different situations where where we we just wanted to have that in person resource to offer, and so we started to do what we could with limited volunteer resources, donated supplies, and when those calls would come in through our crisis line that that really benefited most from that in person community based response, we would send out what we called a bummer squad, and that was going to be a couple of staff, hopefully somebody with some medical background, alongside somebody with a, a background in mental health addiction and and crisis work to go out and really kind of work with these individuals. So for about 20 years, we were doing the bummer squad thing alongside really building up the resources that Wiper Clinic offered at its actual physical campus location. Uh, and and when, when we were able to provide more of a, a you know, crisis respite center, a place for folks to come in crisis, spend some hours really being able to deescalate, uh, you know, really identify resources that could help them address the underlying issues so the next time those triggers emerged, the crisis wasn't so bad. Uh, Wiper Clinic started to establish itself as a place where law enforcement would bring people instead of the hospital too. So as we're building trust with the community to do this response out in the community, to, to have Wiper come into their homes or come into their camps to talk with them, public safety was really starting to see Wiper Clinic as a viable alternative to the hospital. Uh, and then even more so as we started to add case management services, we provided an opportunity to get folks connected to resources rather than continue to circle them through the criminal legal system. Uh, and so by the late 80s, as you know, CIT programs were starting to pick up around the country, like Joe just said, uh, we, we found a really fortunate partnership with the city of Eugene 
to be able to formalize that bummer squad, that volunteer community-based crisis we sponsor we were doing, uh, and, and to really capitalize on the trust that we had from public safety. As Joe said, a lot of folks have a tendency to just reach out and call 911 when something feels wrong, when they're in that crisis. You know, when you're when you're in that in that moment of 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 panic, you know, you perceive yourself to be in this very emergent situation, and it can be a very natural inclination to want to call 911 because you're in an emergency. You know, what I'm what I'm feeling is emergent, so I want that emergency response, right? Or for other situations, somebody's seeing something happen out in the community and they want that handled yesterday, right? They want it handled right away, and so there's a tendency to call 911 because that's the most rapid access that you can get to a resource. Recognizing that 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 point of access was going to make us really available to a large cross-section of the community, more folks would be able to get in contact with the mobile crisis services through public safety than they were by looking up the wiper clinic number. Uh, we chose to integrate the, the mobile crisis response into the public safety system. And so the CAHOOTS model is that we have this third-party contractor of civilian, non-law enforcement, unarmed first responders who are using public safety resources and going out and responding to not just mental health calls, but, you know, those calls with that are that are really centered around a crisis related to addiction uh, or substance use, um, you know, housing, um, but but even going a step further and really looking at preventative measures that we can have. If we can go in and mediate conversation when it's starting to escalate, then then we can prevent that that individual or that family from having police contact because there's a disagreement over, you know, a young person's school attendance. Um, the uh, the cahoots model, you know, starting off on the fourth of July in eighty nine with that first response, uh, we 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 were really small when we got started, uh, only forty hours a week, and we really looked toward the community to inform when services needed to be expanded. And it's only been in the last four or five years that we've moved to a twenty four seven response. Um, today in Eugene and Springfield, that we have a combined sixty service hours a day, so that's two vans that roll overnight three vans during the day. Um, our, our teams, our responders go through 500 hours of field training and 30 hours of class time before they actually start responding as part of that two-person team. And because Wiper Clinic is a, a consensus-based collective, we approach our, our organization in a different way. And that means that we're able to give everybody who works on the CAHOOTS team an individual mentor who supports them with peer supervision. Um, they're that person that you call after you've had a really rough shift. Um, they're that person that you reach out to during your training process to say, you know, I'm feeling really nervous about using this this police radio to to receive our calls. How did you get comfortable, you know, communicating with dispatch while you have all these officers and other folks that are listening in on on you know every transmission that you make? Uh, and and we really we really believe that because we have taken this different approach to how we've organized our our services, how we support our staff, uh, that we're able to create this program that has become really resilient. Uh, really flexible and really dynamic in what we're able to offer to our community. Um, just last year, CAHOOTS responded to over 25,000 calls for service. Uh, and then to, I'm going to kind of go, so 25,000 calls for service. In Eugene specifically, CAHOOTS was involved in 20,000 responses. Two or 3,000 of those were co-response where we showed up with patrol or we staged and waited for fire or police to go in, secure a scene, and then CAHOOTS took over. Um, but the majority of our responses we handle without any sort of other involvement from traditional public safety infrastructure. So we had 25,000 calls for service in our metro area. In Eugene, which is our big population center, we were involved in 20,000 responses. 18,000 of those we handled without any sort of other units whatsoever. And within those calls, CAHOOTS teams only called for certain, called for police cover 311 times. That's 311 times, that, so maybe once a day on average that we're calling. And that's a combination of code one and code three response support where we need police cover because something has escalated beyond our ability to de-escalate verbally and situations where we have somebody who's in such profound need, uh, who is unable to manage their safety and the safety of others and we need to get them to the hospital um, that we're calling in police to do that that peace officer hold um, and and that really you know th something that joe said really resonates with me and that that notion of of when we're talking about having somebody other than police responding to these calls for service having somebody other than armed officers going out to that person in crisis and this perception that there is uh danger you know that that this is an unsafe scene to be sending an unarmed civilian into but then that question of how many times have you know those officers been stabbed or shot when they've gone out on mental health responses, uh, you know, by and large, we it's been our experience that you know a crisis emerges when a need goes unmet, 
And the role of a mobile crisis and intervention team is to go in, identify that unmet need, and then with the recognition that the individual that we're serving, that the patient is the expert in their experience, it's our job to ask questions, to listen, to empathize, and then work with that patient to develop some, to develop a plan that they want to pursue to be able to find other ways to address those needs. You know, that includes connection to other resources. Maybe that's taking somebody to shelter, taking somebody for a ride to get them over so they can get a shower and some laundry and a hot meal, uh, because that's what's causing all the other things that they're experiencing to, to just, you know, really spiral out of control. Um, and, you know, I could, I could talk for hours about any one of the specific call types, but, you know, I think the thing that's, that's really important to, to really highlight here, and that's something that, that Joe brought up, is that these, these responses, you know, whether it's, it's Joe's unit going out to talk to somebody or the CAHOOTS team going out, these are not calls for service that fall under the purview of what we would generally consider to be, you know, the role of police in our community. Uh, these are situations where we need to have a different type of first responder. And as Joe has identified, you know, our, our, our nation is really at, at this, this pivot point where we're, there seems to be this objective to really transition to a different type of responder. And while we're in this moment of transition, I think it's, you know, very, um, very important to really highlight that, you know, we need officers really trained up in these responses because no matter what kind of outreach we do, no matter how much legwork we do to say that, you know, you need to call this number or this is how you access this mobile crisis response, police are still going to be going out to all of these different situations that, that, are, that are occurring in the community. And we want them to make sure that they have, you know, the adequate training to respond in a compassionate and empathetic way, um, while also trying to find ways to really bring in this new type of first responder, like the CAHOOTS program, you know, like the services offered in Olympia, Washington with their crisis response unit, or in Denver with the STAR program. Um, you know, even seeing the um, inclusion of crisis workers in the dispatch center in Houston with the Harris Center, um, you know, is, is another really good example of how public safety can have a more direct role in supporting mental health responses separate from law enforcement, separate from fire, and separate from EMS services. Um, there's so much more content that we can go into, both about Joe's program, as well as the work that I'm doing here in Eugene and Springfield and with cities across the U.S., but I would really like this conversation to be informed by you all. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to kind of take this moment to pause and, and um, turn it over to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I see, okay, at first I wanted to introduce members of the Mental Health Subcommittee. And we have Dave Fitzgerald, First Sergeant Matt Puya, Brian Stockton, Cicely Whitfield, and um, Whitney Kernoodle, and I see Dave Fitzgerald has a question. Over to you, Dave. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Good. Yes, sir. Um, got a quick question for both of you. So, Joe, maybe you begin, and Tim, if you could follow up. So, you guys, how about describe a little bit about the aspects of your services that involve proactive going out, not just call response. You guys talked a lot about the calls and the number of calls and who's reaching out to you, but talk a little bit about the proactive part of your job uh, that minimizes maybe the number of calls you would get if, and, and so just talk about that. Thanks, David. Awesome question. And yeah, that's a big part of what our unit does now because of how small we are. So uh, in fact, we have a program called PIC, which is the Program for Intensive Care Coordination. And it's two of our police officers from the mental health unit. It's uh, one clinician and then one paramedic. And so what we've done is we've identified our top 100 utilizers of services that are costing the most money because they're getting committed the most. They have the highest uh, acuity needs. And so uh, we proactively go out and engage them pre-crisis. And so, and what that looks like is, you know, we again, we look at the top utilizers of services. Well, some of them, I think our top one had like 311 emergency commitments in one year. And so if you, if you put a cost on that, plus time, plus everything else, it was massive. And so the program was born out of that. It's a, it's a collaboration, obviously, with the stakeholders. But what they saw was a, I, I don't know, I don't want to misquote it, but I want to say it was around 43% reduction in 911 calls from those top 100 uh, utilizers of services. Because what we also learned is that some of our 
sickest people in the community are so isolated because families kind of cut them off. They, they don't really have a social support network. And so a lot of it's just, they're lonely. And so we would do these like just routine maintenance checks that every week where we'll go out and just spend a little bit of time with them, say, hey, how you doing? Do you have your meds? Do you need a ride anywhere? How's your food looking? When's your next follow-up appointment? And because we have the clinician to plug in with them, again, they're actively case managing them. So we do have a portion of our unit that's all they do is the proactive side uh, instead of just staying by waiting for the call because again th there's too many calls for us to be able to adequately handle and so we try to get smart and say how can we best utilize our small uh, unit and, and a big part of that is the proactive side so anyway Tim yeah, you know, we're, we're a little limited with what we're able to do on the proactive side of things just, just because of capacity. Um, the, you know, our teams are responding to 60, 70 plus calls per day. Uh, and that leaves us precious little time to go around to, uh, you know, camps to check in with people or, um, you know, even do a little bit of street outreach while we go to get a cup of coffee on a lunch break. Uh, and so we've had to rely on other programming within Whiteboard Clinic, which is a federally qualified health center, to really support more of the proactive side of things. Uh, Whiteboard Clinic offers a, a walk-in crisis center and a crisis line that folks can call. Uh, but we're also we also have case management services, medical and dental clinics, as well as all manner of outpatient behavioral health services. So um, I think on one side, there, there's a lot that's going on with just being connected to those other services at organization. Um, but we also do really engage in a, a significant amount of community education. That takes a lot of different forms. One of those is regular de-escalation trainings in our community, where we talk about um, not just how to de-escalate verbally, um, but really how to in, engage with somebody to say, hey, it looks like you're having a rough time. Can I call somebody for you? Um, you know, there, there are other things that we do, uh, which include going in and doing presentations on specific issues. If somebody really wants to talk about harm reduction or trauma-informed care, uh, you know, even uh, more specifically, uh, you know, issues around youth suicide, we've, we've, we've really molded community education to, um, you know, address specific issues or specific audience. Additionally, uh, we also go into every eighth and 10th grade classroom in our school districts that we, that we serve to, to talk about mental wellness, uh, to talk about you know, common mental health symptoms, and then really you know, what folks can do, what, what youth can do to really support each other, recognize when they're starting to feel a different way or when they're seeing those warning signs in their, in their friends and family, and then how you can reach out in ways that, that don't um, you know, include judgment um, and, and to really kind of approach things from more of a compassionate place. Um, you know, we also participate in a lot of different collaborative care conferences that go on. Um, so, you know, like Joe highlighted, the frequent systems utilizers is a huge area um, of need. And so you'll see CAHOOTS representatives alongside personnel from the police department, from the fire and EMS departments, uh, as well as a hospital and county behavioral health authorities to really talk about these complex cases and look, how, look to CAHOOTS as a, a resource because we are 24-7. When we find that person at three in the morning that's missed every you know appointment during business hours the last two weeks our team knows hey if if, if we see you know dan down on the corner seventh let's get him over to the hospital they'll hold him for a social service consult until the morning when the caseworker from aps can come over and do the intake with that person so we, we find ourselves really kind of acting to support a lot of other organizations and a lot of other services as, as the kind of 24 7 component to their proactive services for for their community Thanks a lot, guys. And I see a question from First Sergeant Matt Puya. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Naomi. And uh, thank you to Joe and Tim for joining us tonight. I appreciate your insight into this. Uh, just one question I had specifically for Mr. Black uh, regarding uh, when some of the practitioners are going out and responding to these calls for service and then they need to request some type of law enforcement backup due to some type of uh, violence or danger, escalating circumstances. Uh, how often are those responders injured uh, during the course of that interaction with uh, the person that's undergoing that crisis? Uh, how often does that occur? Um, and does that cause any type of issues with locating uh, people that are willing to go out and, and respond to those types of calls? So we've never had a patient, or excuse me, we've never had an employee injured as a result of patient contact. And that, that's in the 31 years that we've been doing this. I mean, you know, that I, I, I would be remiss to say that there, you know, or, you know, if I, if I deny that there are occasionally skirmishes that go on, you know, I've, 
um, you know, we wrestled with a couple of folks. Um, there's the occasional sucker punch, but really, you know, those situations generally are about us not paying attention to the patient, you know, not really having our eyes on, you know, all components of scene safety and situational awareness. And, and the reason that we have that rate of safety where we've never had a serious injury is because we spend so much time in our staff training on de-escalation and even just recognizing how physical presence in a space can really inform an interaction. So I'm, I'm a short guy, so this isn't as much of a concern for me, but for some of our, tall, our responders on the team who are taller, maybe have broader shoulders, one of the things we'll talk about is when you're talking to somebody cross your arms like this, you're going to be sending a different message than you want to, you know? So maybe it's that you need to keep your hands at your sides. And instead of that direct one-on-one -on -one face to face, I'm going to turn to the side a little bit so that you, I'm showing you that this isn't a confrontation that you have an exit. You know, we're not going to be blocking doorways. You know, you're looking is, is the weather going to inform how this interaction goes, you know, and, and if, if we can have this person, if we're outside, can we have this person come and sit in the back of our van? turn on the heater, play some music that they like, and give them a bottle of water before we start talking. You know, a recognition that if you haven't been able to meet your basic needs for three days, you know, every little thing is going to feel, you know, like, like it's at a 10 out of 10, right? So maybe if we just take a few minutes to warm you up, get you hydrated, we're going to have a completely different type of interaction. Um, when we see that things are starting to kind of go towards maybe we need that police support, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of communication between the team members, and that's why we assign shift partners. So you get to know your shift partner, right? You know, Joe and Ernie work together, so they they have you, Joe. You probably you can raise an eyebrow, and that's going to tell Ernie something that that would take two sentences to get out, right? You know, the same thing happens with our team. So when I was working full time out in the fields, if if I was getting really attached to an outcome, and that was starting to escalate and spin up, you know, the patient I was talking to. My shift partner, Matt, you know, he would kind of raise both eyebrows at me. And that was, hey, why don't you let me, you know, take a crack at this? And so then I would say, you know, I, you know, I think, sorry, I think I'm I'm just getting attached to something here. Let's 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 shift focus a little bit. You know, so it's a lot of a lot of communication, a lot of situational awareness, uh, but then also a lot of debrief and support after those situations. So we can talk about what went well, so we can replicate that next time. Additionally, what didn't go well, what is it that I'm gonna need to pay more attention to the next time I'm having a patient interaction? Great, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay, I have a question and I'm wondering, our focus in our subcommittee is um, responding to mental health calls, but both you gentlemen, I think also respond to uh, substance abuse and homelessness related calls. We are hoping that whatever our county ends up putting in place will kind of benefit all these different populations. But can each of you speak about that a little bit? Do we need different tools for different, you know, for homeless groups versus substance abusers versus mentally ill folks? Or is 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 what we is what you guys do kind of helping all those groups? Yeah, I I, I think it's all intertwined. And you know, my experience of this has really been just, you know, people are people are people. And what we know about mental illness is it doesn't discriminate. Substance abuse doesn't discriminate. You know, people have ideas. When you say words like homelessness or mental illness, immediately a picture comes to mind. But we have to remember that that's not the entire story. And so there are people who live in affluent areas who have jobs who are absolutely struggling. And so just as much as, because that would be like saying, do we need to create a specialized team for people who live in expensive homes and have jobs that are mentally ill? No. And so just because you're homeless and just because you maybe are unfunded and just because it's harder for you to have access to care and your A score is like a nine or a 10, it's the same techniques. You know what everything Tim saying it, it works on everybody whether it's your mother in crisis or a guy under a bridge in a in a encampment the same techniques work and if you have compassion and you're patient and you have a basic level of understanding of just human desire and what their intrinsic desires are and it's everybody just wants to be seen they want to be heard and they want to feel loved and so how do we show up and deliver that in the midst of whatever they're going through. Because what we understand when people are in crisis is that, you know, most times they're not thinking clearly, right? When emotional mind is high, rational mind is low. And so we have to try and get them to see it through a different lens and provide perspective. And we do it through just really spending time with them. It's almost like, 
gr grief counseling, right? Sometimes the best thing you can do is show up and say nothing and just be there. You know, people want to just fill space with noise and it just overwhelms. So I don't think that you have to have any type of specialized, I know some places do, there's homeless outreach teams, but I would argue they need the same skill set for the mental health teams, for the substance abuse teams. Because what, what we know too is that mental illness possibly is the foundation of all of those things, right? Is if you're homeless uh, and, you're, and you're a substance user, are you also mentally ill? On some level, possibly yes, even if it's depression, anxiety, whatever. If you're a substance user, it's very, very fair to assume that you are self-medicating or masking some type of, you know, internal struggle that you're having or mental illness. And so to me, it's really all the same. And I would say the beauty too, for wherever you guys are at in this journey is there's no need to reinvent any wheel, right? I mean, everything that is successful already exists. And so it's just a matter of saying, okay, we like this, we like this, we like this, and then just put it together. But anyway, that's my two cents on that. Uh, maybe Tim has a different idea. No, Joe, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, yeah, there there is no way to say that the response that you're going out on is only going to be about this one thing. And so that's all you need to be focused on. That's all you need to be trained in. Um, it would be, you know, absurd to to assume that um, fire, you know, fire department is only going to worry about, uh, you know, single story structure fires. And, and we'll get another team to come in and handle the skyscrapers, right? You know, and then um, we'll have another group who their sole responsibility is extrication for that motor vehicle collision. A fire department is expected to be able to respond to all manner of, of you know, medical emergencies and situations where they're the best, you know, the best tool, right? And so, you know, I really think that, you know, as long as we're talking about this being part of public safety, you know, even if we do want to bring in, you know, even if your community doesn't want, do, does want to introduce behavioral health first response as a standalone entity alongside patrol, alongside fire and EMS, that service still needs to be responsive and really needs to have a lot of different resources and tools at their disposal. They still need to be able to respond to a lot of different call types. Chances are that that patient that we see on Monday for one type of crisis could have another thing unfold on Wednesday where they're calling and it's going to be, you know, and they need a response. And if we have a different type of unit, a different type of tool from the community going out to talk to that person on each of those situations, that person has to go through that trauma that they're, they're processing from start to finish rather than saying, Hey, you know, we, we, we saw that you contacted us on Monday. We read the report. We know that, that this is kind of connected to that. And so that we can kind of build on, on where we left off. But, um, yeah, you know, just just like, you know, officers should all have, you know, really, you know, really robust mental health training because there's going to be a mental health component to nearly every response that an officer goes out on. You know, the same thing with a behavioral health unit. They need to be able to be trained in, in de-escalation. Um, you know, they need to be able to be trained in, in substance use. They need to know how to access housing resources and they need to be able to, de you know, respond to that mental illness. So um, it's, it's really all about, uh, you know, kind of intentional redundancy almost. Great, that makes so much sense. We don't all just come with one neat little label on us. We're complex people. We have lots of different things we're dealing with. Okay, uh, I see Dave Fitzgerald has a question. Hi guys. Um, so in Arlington, we're about 230,000 people. We do somewhere between six and 700 ECO TDOs a year. Um, and those, until the law, in, until laws change, those are going to be handled by the police no matter what we come up with, right? So <clears throat> what I want to ask first to you, Joe, is you guys aren't 24-7 yet, but you've got the substantial team. Roughly, what percentage of mental health calls do you guys think you are able to manage in that non-24-7? <clears throat> is it 50%, 75%? What, what's your guess? It's probably about 2%. It is wow. significantly low because our so our department does on average 1,200 emergency detentions per month, and so you know there's no way we can get to those. And so we we focus on the the really high need. So if it's like an active suicide in progress, a jumper, firearms involved, what we call escalated mental health calls, we'll respond to those. So it's more of a specialized approach. Um, but of the 1,200, and and that's just the emergency detentions. So there's still I mean, there's, I don't know, probably 5,000 mental health calls a month, you know, our unit, because we're also in teams, right? And so really out of the 10, that's only five teams. And so we probably, 
we we respond if we're super busy we'll probably hit four to five calls in a day and the reason i say that is because again we're not tied to a clock where a patrol officer is like trying to wrap up that call super fast to get to the next one we'll spend an hour to three hours on one call because the big difference is i actually care about what funding source you have what social support you have what hospital system you're plugged into who your doctors are and i'm going to try and put you in the right system of care so that way we can be notified we also try and get them to sign a waiver of release if they're comfortable with it so that we can be notified when they're going to be discharged so that we can follow up with them and we stay engaged with them throughout the process so because of that it takes time you know it's a week on a busy day we're doing again maybe five calls on a, and that's like we're bumping but sometimes it might only be two or three you know but again there there's several hours at a, at a time no, that's very helpful. So essentially, you're running about um, 24 times the number of ECO TDOs that we are, and that's probably you know you probably 24 times our population. So that's interesting. Um, Tim, I got a question for you. D did I get this right? 25,000 uh, calls, not all mental health, but 25,000 calls to Cahoots. Was it in the last year or last 12 months? Or was that? Yeah, that was last fiscal year. So July and 1 is year 30. Yeah. And then you said of those, did I get this right? 311 of those needed to be ECO TDO'd only. So your numbers are significantly different or did I get that right? Yeah, the 311 is code one and code three recovery requests, as well as what we call a POH. So that's that officer hold. Um, so specifically the holds, I think we did 150, and this is, you know, kind of broad strokes here, but I, th I think we had 150 POH requests last year. So, okay. you know, and that's, and that's, you know, a lot of that has to do with just the fact that, uh, you know, like Joe mentioned, plainclothes officers showing up in a, you know, on our car does a lot for de-escalation, you know, right out of the gate. And we've well, kind of taken that a step further by, you know, this, this kind of complete, completely different visuals. And that, that also has really indicated to the community that, you know, you've got a, you've got an opportunity to really kind of stay in the driver's seat for this intervention here. And when we get to that point where we're seeing that you need to go to the hospital, that's that's what's going to get us, you know, that that resolution that we need tonight. We have that luxury of time because we're not an emergency service. We're not worried about a code three response that might be coming in over the radio. Just like Joe said, you, we can spend a couple of hours with somebody to really kind of talk through and say, hey. Here's what we're seeing. This is why we want to do this. This is why we need to get you to the hospital. And if they're still saying, no, no, I don't want to go, then we say, all right, you know, we understand that. We hear that uh, and we respect your desire, but we can't let you go, you know. And so we're going to have to call an officer in to, to take you to the hospital if you're still unwilling to go with us. And so at the point of the call, the cahoots or cuffs conversation, um, you know, we still have an opportunity for that person and, you know, one final time stay, you know, I guess metaphorically in the driver's seat around how they get to the hospital, but they've, you know, we've articulated this, this is where we need to get you tonight to be able to wrap this up. So it's up to you to really make the choice about how you get there. Thanks guys. It's very helpful. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, one of the problems, and we even saw it in Ernie and Joe crisis cops where a very ill person is taken to the hospital. The next day, he's already out of there. Um, we see that as well in our community, where people we might want to see stay in the hospital till they're stabilized are released very early, when long before they're stable. Has anybody? Have you guys figured out how to <laughs> fix the hospitals, or do you have a workaround around that? What? How, do, how are you responding to that problem? Uh, Tim and I are going to run for office. Um, no, I mean, it's it, it's a massive, this is a problem in the country, is big pharma runs business. And you, it's a sad reality in the United States that your level of care is directly correlated to your ability to pay for that care. If you have funding, if you have insurance, you're not going to get released super quick. If you are unfunded, you are going to be stabilized very quickly and pushed out. They'll have you sign a safety contract so that they're off the hook of any uh, liability. But it's it's really unfortunate because we have people that absolutely need to be stabilized, and that's going to require more than 12 hours or 24 hours. And yet, because they know, the hospital knows, like, we're going to eat this bill. This guy's not going to be able to pay for this, or she's not going to be able to cover this cost. You know, they're going to get pushed out. And and it's just this revolving door. And, you know, the, the patient themselves 
cells starts to learn that of, yeah, I know that this is just gonna be a quick thing. And so that's part of the intervention as well as communicating that to them of like, hey, look, a lot of this is really gonna be dependent on you and your ability to like engage in these services and these resources because there are programs in place that do support those that are unfunded. But because you're an adult, you have to be like voluntarily willing to show up and sign up and do the paperwork. And there's people that'll help you. But it's like, if, if someone is truly addicted or a substance user, how do we get them stabilized enough to where they can understand the benefit or the need to actually get themselves hooked up with these resources? And another problem is so much of, and I'll tell you here, probably even just three to four years ago and beyond, eight or nine out of every 10 of our calls that the unit would respond to, if people were psychotic or experiencing any type of psychosis, it was organic to their mental illness. I'll tell you right now, eight out of every 10 of our calls is meth induced. Meth is just like taking over our city. And so the problem is that they still meet that criteria to take them to the hospital, but as soon as they get to the hospital and they do a UA and they find out that they have methamphetamine, all they're gonna do is just get them good enough to where they can push them out. And we never actually get to the root cause of the problem, which is their mental illness. And so it, it's such a challenge, but no, this is a much bigger issue than just a workaround. It really is like this is a legislative issue. This is a you know lack of funding. You know, Texas is historically in the bottom uh, when it comes to federal dollars for support on mental health uh, per capita. And so it's it's a matter of coming together as a community. And I'll tell you, this is where we've done really well in San Antonio is, you know, there's an organization called STRAC, which is our South Texas Regional Advisory Council. And their, their job typically was to like control air life and then monitor EMS. And so they, they control like where EMS shows up, but also if there's a, let's say five counties south of here, there's a major rollover and they need air life. They will dispatch the helicopter to go to which level one trauma center. But because of the need coming in in the community outcries, they said, okay, we're gonna help look at this emergency det detention problem in law enforcement as well. So everybody came together, all the stakeholders came together. And what they've decided is, look, if we're going to address this problem, we're all going to have to hurt a little bit. So even our for-profit private hospitals, that are a, that's a business. And, the, and it again, very hard to go into the business of making money when you're talking about serving people in a mental health population. But they all even agreed and said, hey, look, our typical, um, our charitable give back to the community is about 9% of our intakes are unfunded. If we're going to sign on to this program, we understand that we're going up to about 35 to 40%, and yet they still show up. And so it's having that type of mindset of, yeah, we're going to take a hit, but we want to actually serve the need in our community. Um, and that's why we've been successful here in San Antonio is despite the fact that we don't have federal support and we don't have capacity to treat the amount of people that we have, we can still do a relatively good job but the problem exists. People get taken to the hospital and kicked out, taken to the hospital, kicked out, and it's just this revolving door. Yeah, and so I, all I would add to that are you know, two things is that um, we have found moderate success in having our medical director be an ER physician. Uh, that means that you know, whenever we're having those meetings, um, whenever we're doing some sort of training, we're getting firsthand you know, accounts of what happens after we bring that patient in to the hospital. Uh, and at the same time, we have that avenue for feedback when we are really concerned about patient care. Um, the other thing that we can do to address, you know, this issue of really of just folks getting, you know, spun out, you know, come in one door, turn around a couple of times, go out the other door and get streeted after, you know, they've been evaluated is to set realistic expectations. When we're taking somebody to the hospital because they want to try and get on a new medication, you know, we'll, we'll be up front with them and say, look, you know, this is likely going to play out this way, you know, it can be six hours in paper scrubs and they're gonna refer you to an outpatient prescriber. You know, so we hear that this is where you wanna go. We can take you there to try and meet this need, but we need to recognize that, um, you know, because because of your background, because of where you you sleep at night, you you probably are going to get treated differently than, than you're expecting, you know? And so it's really just about recognizing the realities of the broken system that we're in and just doing whatever we can to advocate for folks and, and support them and trying to navigate those waters. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a tough problem. We're going to have to put our heads together on that one. <laughs> yeah, I know the whole nation does. Okay, over to you, Matt. All right, uh, I have a question that was uh, sent to me by somebody that's, that's I think, listening in, but they're not in a, po a position to ask this question. It's a three-part question. It's for both you gentlemen. Um, and if you need me to repeat it, uh, please let me know. But 
the question is basically, uh, do the programs that you are a part of, do they reduce the number of people that end up in jail? Do you have any data to support that? And then also, do you do any work in the jails as part of your groups? All right, so I, I can answer pretty uh, concisely. So yes, it does reduce uh, jail population. And the data is just real quick. Our Bear County Jail has 5,000 bed capacity. In 2010 or 11, uh, we were being threatened by the state of being fined because we were over capacity. And so the minds came together and was like a, a very simple fix. We'll build an annex. We'll just build more beds. And somebody from Bear County Mental Health came in and said, well, hold on a second. What if we actually took a look at who's inside of our jails? And this is where jail diversion came from for us. I know it's been around for a while, but we fully adopted the jail diversion program here. And because of that, because what we know is, is if you have a serious mental illness, especially, you're likely to stay in jail four to five times longer than like a violent uh, uh, offender that has social connections and can post their bond and get out. Uh, so they looked at who was in the jail. That by diverting people out of jail, now we sit around 4,000 beds. We didn't build a bigger jail and we're 1,000 beds empty uh, consistently year over year because the programs we have in place now are any officer that arrests anybody at any time for anything. It does not matter. We have a rubber stamp that we have to put on the back of the booking slip and ask four mental health questions. And that's, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental illness? Are you currently on any medication? Um, have you ever uh, attempted suicide and are you currently suicidal? And if they answer yes to any of those, it goes into a bin and our local mental health authority has a clinician that works in the jail. They do an assessment. And if they can divert them pre-magistrate, pre-even going to jail, then they'll divert them. And so there's a lot of people that are getting released from jail before they actually even get mag magistrated or sent to the actual jail. And, uh, and and that's, of course, unless it's like a felony or a violent crime, uh, they will, but even them, they will get expedited over to the, because the, we have a city jail and a county jail. Everyone goes to city jail first, but they'll get expedited over to the county jail and they'll start receiving their mental health services in jail. And then the last question is, we don't, as a city, now our Bear County unit, they have, they have a full-time uh, mental health unit as well. And so they actually have people that work in the mental health portion of the jail, uh, but our city, we don't work in the in the jails at all. And for you know Eugene and Springfield, our our partners in, in public safety estimate uh, based on their criteria that Cahoots teams are diverting about five to eight percent of our calls from arrest uh, and jail time, which you know to me is is a a good start. But on on our side, when we've looked at our numbers, especially because Cahoots can do direct admits for detox and sobering. Uh, we are, you know, we would estimate that our diversion rate is closer to 15%. Um, you know, Cahoots is also responding to a lot of calls that are still below the priority threshold that might get Joe to come out. Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm doing some generalizations there, Joe, but you know, really um, looking at, at the public safety system, Cahoots responses are going to be at a lot lower priority level than what patrol or fire and EMS are going to be going out on. And so because we're going out on these situations before they've escalated to the point where if it were occurring in another city, you would be seeing a couple of units go out to talk to that person. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to really identify a higher level of what we perceive to be a diversion. Uh, you know, again, that's, you know, because Cahoots is getting dispatched the first time somebody calls in about that person shouting in the street instead of after a dozen folks have called over the span of 20 minutes and, and you you got to send somebody out there. So, um, you know, and then when it comes to the jail side of things, there have been times where, especially in the city of Springfield with their Muni jail, when they're booking somebody um, before, you know, before they've been lodged in the jail, if they're expressing suicidal ideation, a Cahoots team is dispatched to go talk with that person and do an assessment and then determine, you know, whether this person needs to go to the hospital or not. And, and, and real quick too, Matt, I'll jump in and say something else. You know, it, it, another sad reality is what we've learned because we have specialty courts like a lot of other uh, big cities is if somebody, because it used to be part of jail diversion was do everything we possibly can to keep people out of jail. Well, I think the pendulum swung and it kind of went a little far. And so now it's coming a little bit closer back to center. But what we're doing now, part of our, the reason we have two detectives on our unit is because they will actually walk warrants, file warrants, and they have to arrest people if they committed a crime and we know that they have a mental illness, a serious mental illness. And maybe that crime was committed because of their illness. 
it's sad, but diverting them and putting them into the hospital is actually worse for them because we know they're unfunded, they're gonna get kicked right out and there's no follow-up. We lose all leverage. So what's happening now is we'll actually walk the warrant, we'll arrest them, we'll get them in jail, but we'll put them in the specialty court for the mental health court. And then through that, now the court system has leverage to say, hey, you know what, part of your um, probation is gonna be you have to stay compliant with your medications, you have to make your appointments, you have to do this and that. And so that actually gives them the incentive to show up and, and get themselves the treatment that they need that they wouldn't otherwise. And then if they fail to do it, then they can revoke their uh, probation and actually serve their time out in jail. But it's very, very successful. I mean, for, I know for the first two years, they had about a 6% recidivism rate uh, on those that we put in the mental health court. I know it's gone up. Uh, I think it's maybe around 35 or 40% now. So it's it's not perfect, but it still is a, it's a good alternative because we know that if they just go to the hospital, um, it, one, you know, you've let them off the hook from whatever crime they committed, even if they are mentally ill. Um, it's it's not like an insanity plea. Uh, they just are sick and off their medications. And so they did something that incited some type of fear in the community. Um, but it's actually better for that individual, sadly, if they get arrested, because then they can get their treatment quasi compelled on them and it has better outcomes. That's great information. Just a follow-up question for you, Joe, is is that court-compelled treatment pre or post plea? Um, that's a good question. So I think it's, I would say it's part of maybe. I, I know, so again, if they get arrested, because we can go talk to the magistrate and put conditions on their bond. So I'll say, hey, look, if you're going to release them, that's cool, but we want to monitor because they've made some threat to the community. Uh, and we want there to be, like, we can kind of have, have some say so in what those uh, um, guidelines are going to be for their probation. And then, um, so I would say it's probably pre-plea then. And because I know that they're, they're, essentially not going to serve time they're given the benefit of the doubt and then they're going to say okay you, you have your first appointment you know tomorrow they meet with the docs they set up their treatment plan and maybe they have monitor or not depending on what the situation was and then they'll be actively monitored to make sure that they're making their appointments and doing all the things now if they don't uh we just notify the judge the judge will say okay we'll revoke it and then we have to pick them up and they they get arrested and then they will do their time, at which point I assume then they would get their sentence or their hearing um, and have to do a plea and all that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, interesting. I know I've seen a lot of reports that say the best way to get mental health treatment is to be arrested and go to a mental health court. Sort Terrible. of sad. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping Arlington will break that and find another way. So hope springs eternal. Um, I wanted to talk, well, Joe, you mentioned your heavy users of 911. And Tim, I'm sure there's people you guys encounter all the time. Where does your community mental health um, department come in? I mean, that's should be there, Bailey. People, these are chronic illnesses. People are going to need long-term care. How does each of you plug in your clients, the people you encounter, with community mental health, and are they are they doing their part? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll tell you again. I think t this is an education uh, issue too, because you know, like our state hospital. We have a state hospital. There's six in Texas, I believe, but we have one here in San Antonio, Sash. And people's assumptions are, hey, my family member, my neighbor, my whoever is really, really sick. You know, they could benefit from six months at the state hospital. It's so unrealistic that we're going to get someone in for that type of care. Uh, you know, our state hospital here in San Antonio used to have uh, just over 3,000 beds. We're down to like 40 something. And so, you know, as they continue to cut beds, cut capacity, it's harder and harder to provide that long-term stabilization. And so, you know, because they've all converted to forensic beds. So as far as community goes, again, we're lucky if we get uh, like a two week, if we get someone in for two to three weeks, that's like, oh my God, they must be really, really sick. And, you know, I don't know of all the people that we're taking to the hospital, as much as we're taking people to the hospital, it's just, it's so 
rare, you know, it, because it really, again, it comes down to insurance and how much, ins how many bed days their insurance covers. Most of them, it's like five or so a month. And so they'll come and do a week and then they get discharged. But then if they get picked up again that same month, it's like, oh, you're out of bed days. So now you're only going to do a few hours. And so it's just, it's a problem that we keep running into. Now we partner, our unit partners with our local mental health authority and the community partners. Um, but they're, they're very much on the reactive side of it. There, there's not a whole lot of going out and engaging. Uh, they're just kind of sitting back because again, the the, the influx, the, the flow of patients coming to them is so heavy that they probably have zero time to do anything. But what I will say is they are, they absolutely believe in our training because just our CIT model, the way it is, a hospital pays out a church because we do our trainings at a church, so they lease it out for the week, and then all of our local stakeholders come together and they they buy the they do pay for the printing, they buy meals, they do a community fair at the school, and so there's there's a lot of support that goes into training officers on how to best utilize the services, and then here's just a fascinating thing for all the data nerds out there, is in 2010 and and earlier. Before, when our department just had the 10% trained, we were doing about 200 emergency detentions per month. And then once we got to 100% trained, now again, we do about 1,200. It's not because there's that many more sick people, it's just that's the benefits of educating the officers. The problem was our capacity didn't increase in the community. And so in the beginning, when it was 200, the community was coming together saying, yeah, bring us your patients. We wanna help you out, bring us your patients. We'll have food for you, we'll have your own computer. You know, bring them, bring them in, it's a business. And now that we're doing 1200, they're like, get the hell out of here. Like, why did you come here? Don't bring any more. We can't take any more. And it's like, what happened? You used to support us. We're busting at the seams everywhere. And so uh, I think people are just frustrated. Again, it's a systemic issue, funding capacity, the ability to treat the, the, the willingness from the end user of wanting to do the things. And so it's just, it's a, it's a very complex um, situation that, uh, that we're dealing with. But anyway, so that's my two cents. Yeah. And what Joe's speaking to is really, you know, universal truth. You know, I, I can't tell if you're talking about San Antonio or Eugene, really, um, yeah, <laughs> at a lot of different places. And so then we, what we have to do is really look at what the underlying issues are. What are the other needs that this person has that, that you know, allow this crisis to unfold? And, and that's where we have to start to identify the, you know, what we can bring in to support that person. Um, you know, it'd be really easy to hand somebody just a list of resources and say, here, this 10 page packet has every housing option in town. This is where every single food pantry is. This is where the clothing closet is. Here's where you go for case, you know, and that it just even talking about it starts to feel overwhelming to me, you know? And so what we're going to do in that situation isn't, all right, you know, you, you're calling us every single night, stop it, or we're going to take you to the hospital. It's why, why? Why is it that you're in this position every night by 9:30? And we start to learn, okay, there's some you're confused about when to take your PRN. You know, so we don't, it's not that you need to go to the hospital because you're calling every time. It's that you're not you're not getting the right information from your prescriber about when you should be taking your medicine. So you feel sleepy all day and then you're just wired all night. You got them reversed. You know, um, if it, if it's that social isolation like you talked about earlier on, Joe, then it's, you know, then what are the other things that are out there to address that, you know, that need? Um, because we can't, you know, rely on a broken system that in many cases has, has allowed folks to end up in these situations where they're calling us every single night. Um, another question, you both deal with the community. So Joe, I know you're doing training for nurses and teachers in CIT and Tim, I was very, um, interested that you guys go out to eighth and 10th graders. Tell me about why you reach out kind of beyond your own department or organization and what benefit you think that brings to the community. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is work ourselves out of a job, right? <laughs> like if we're doing this right, our, our interventions, the things that we're doing in the schools, you know, the things we're doing out in the public to talk about this should be, you know, getting to a place where you can, re you know, resolve your own crisis, where you can address, you know, your neighbor's issue. Um, and so we've, we've really tried to approach this from the standpoint of we, we want everybody to be able to, to deescalate and, and respond, you know, and, and that means, but that means that we got to be able to talk about these things. Additionally, we want folks to know who they're calling for and know how to access us. Uh, so there's a lot of time that we're spending that education around how do you say, you know, to the call taker at dispatch, 
that you're in a crisis and that you want cahoots to respond. Uh, you know, so really learn, learning how to use that that system, how to navigate these resources to to get um, you know to get the outcomes that we all want to see from you know you know for our, for our family for our neighbors. Yeah, no, and I, I I didn't know Cahoots was doing that with the eighth and tenth grade. I love it because you know for years I've been saying, like, yeah, a lot of things need to change to be sure. But I think the first thing that should be reformed is public education in this country. You know, we don't do a good enough job teaching our kids how to become adults. And one of the things that's important is if we educate kids, especially make it part of the curriculum, not an elective, not an extra credit, not a something you can go to, but make it standardized that it's that we normalize the idea of mental health, that everybody falls somewhere on the spectrum. And we start to just accept the fact that like the, the price of admission for living life is going to be suffering on some level. We're going to be sad at some points. We're going to be mad at some points. And so how do we deal with that? Because if we can address those issues early on, and then when they become adults, they're better equipped to actually have those coping strategies to deal with their own struggles. And they don't think like, oh, I see problem, I call police, or I see problem, I call someone else to handle it. But just culturally, I mean, this is something that we've evolved so quickly away from that idea or that sense of neighbor. You know, I, I don't know how old you are, Tim. You know, I'm, I'll be 39 next week. But even when I grew up, I mean, my neighbors were allowed to raise me. If they saw me doing stupid things in the street, they could tell me something. Now, if your neighbor comes out and corrects your kids, some people will be like, oh, heck no, you don't talk to my, and you know, it's unbelievable of, I saw a study recently that just even in like the fifties house, like the average house size was like 800 square feet. And there, that was a four person home. And now the average home size is nearly 3000 square feet. And it's got like three people. And so we've, we've doubled or tripled our, our home sizes and our sense of community has gone almost to nil because, you know, it's just the way we live now. And so we're so closed off. And while we're more technologically connected than ever, we're actually more isolated than ever. And then throw in COVID and everything else. And it's like, yeah, no wonder the there's been a spike in depression and anxiety and people being unwilling to deal with their own problems and their own suffering is because it's not a skill set that's been taught. You know, I don't know how to, act. even something simple like Tim just said, like, hey, I'm feeling this way and I, I would like cahoots to respond. Believe it, you have to teach that. Because if you don't know that, it's like, what do I know to do? Well, I know when there's a problem, I can either hide it, I can lie about it, or I can essentially tell someone, and then that someone might overreact because they don't know how to deal with it. And then suddenly the police are showing up because your kid won't get out of bed and go to school. And it's like, how did, how did this become my thing? You know, and so it really is education. I think it all stems down to the more we can get on the same page about just the human experience and accept it for what it is and the better we can understand the brain and just what it, what it means to be alive in this life and that you know we can unite through our collective like story instead of just focusing on differences and focusing on the problems uh, it really could be something that's super beneficial to where it's like, okay, it doesn't matter that I don't have insurance or, you know, and and I know that's scattered, but it's just the way my mind works. But I'll, I'll end with this, you know, especially when you're a program that hasn't yet started, you know, don't let fear paralyze you from action. Because I'll tell you this, the one of the best ways to learn is by doing. And, you know, you hear about these like housing first initiatives. Uh, we learned here in San Antonio, it was like, all right, the USAA was like, we're not going to have any homeless vets in San Antonio. So they bought a bunch of apartments and they were just scooping up homeless people from downtown that are veterans and put them in these apartments. It was a terrible idea, but we didn't realize that until it happened because you're, even though you're homeless, you have your homeless community. And so now we're plucking people, putting them by themselves in affluent areas with no community just to sit in an apartment. And they're sitting there like, um, hey guys, I want to kill myself. Like, not because I really want to, but this is a miserable life. I'd rather be downtown with my friends on the street. And it was like, who would have known? So you just, you learn by doing. And so there's so many people that have so many meetings to talk about so many things and we never get started. And so it's like, just go figure it out because it really is, while while you can adopt programs to be sure, it, it's community specific, so much based on what resources you have available. Okay, now I'm not seeing any other calls. I mean, any other hands raised. So folks, raise your hands if you wanna ask some questions, but here would be my last question. You both have very impressive programs, but if you were king for a day, each of you, and could make um, some entity or, or something different in your community work better um, to make these problems 
reduced in some way? I mean, what would you, what would each of you like to see in your community that you don't have or you don't have enough of? For us, uh, the thing that keeps coming up for me, and this started back, um, the, the first time that I, I really had the light bulb go off for me was was way too recent, and, and to be honest, and it was um, in conversation with Melina Abdullah in February um, around how we, how folks access cahoots in our community. Um, you know, the way that we've built our program from the beginning is that you call public safety non-emergency, that you're calling, you know, essentially the police department when you're in crisis, and that while we have created a service that is generally accessible to a large cross-section of the community. There are many folks in our neighborhoods that can't call cahoots because they don't feel like the police are a safe resource. And because that point of access is shared with other public safety infrastructure, we, we, we might as well not be there, you know, for them. And so, you know, if, if I were, if I were, I guess, king for a day, the thing that I would really look at is, is how can we, still utilize that public safety infrastructure? How can we still be plugged in and be that resource that's accessible to anybody who can pick up a phone and dial 911 or the non-emergency line, but also still have some more autonomy and independence so that we are accessible to folks who are who are undocumented and feel like they can't contact us when they're in crisis or because they saw um, that neighbor um, you know, get arrested, they, they feel fearful um, you know, about utilizing that same point of contact. And so for us, it's really, you know how how could we, that we we just want to see this service as accessible to everybody as possible, and the feedback that we're getting from our community, especially now that folks have more vocabulary to talk about these issues, is that there are folks out there who just don't feel safe calling us because you do have to, on some level, you know, call public safety on yourself when you're in crisis. Yeah, I love that, and um, I think for me too, it would be. I mean, this is massive because you're giving me a lot of power, but. Um, I would do a few things. One is I would standardize everything in law enforcement in this country because we are so we're decentralized, and so nothing is the same in policing in America. We have some officers that go through a three-month academy, some go through an eight-month academy, um, you know. And so I think that needs to be really, really ramped up, and it has to be robust if you're going to be in this profession. I think you shouldn't be able to be in law enforcement until you're at least 25 years old and or have a four year degree and or you have one year of social services where you learn how to have conversation skills without weapons. Uh, so I, there's a whole bunch I would like to redo on the law enforcement side. Beyond that, though, if, if you're talking specific to programs, I think that there absolutely is a balance between what CAHOOTS does and what the mental health unit does. I would love for our unit to be ramped up so that we could be 24-7 and actually respond more to the actual mental health calls. But as long as we're this small, it's going to be hard to actually do that. But I think having a CAHOOTS type program and having a specialized mental health unit would be ideal because then, you know, imagine the collaboration that would happen just between those two units. You know, it'd just be an overlap where they could call us direct, we could call them direct and say, hey, look, this isn't really even a, because at the end of the day, we looked at it, we're basically armed clinicians because yes, we have a firearm, but we're in, we dress like Tim is right now. And so when we show up, you know, I think it's like, yeah, we can handle these calls, but also if it's something that it can be a smooth handoff or a warm handoff to a Kahoot team, then then why not? You know, and and so having those programs both uh, fully, you know, running, I think is the perfect way because I think there's too many conversations about fully eliminating police, which is just not realistic. Uh, it's I, I don't see how that's feasible or possible at least in the next decade until there's a massive campaign on re-educating the the country. And then, you know, to just say, we're going to go, um, we're not going to allow any type of clinicians or civilians to respond. It's just going to be police only, police only, police only. And then they're not adequately trained. I mean, that's disastrous. And, you know, you're really inviting a terrible outcome anytime you're, you're doing that. And, you know, sadly, we're seeing things like that where it goes wrong. And, you know, we just have one here, sadly, um, which was covered in the news, but it was an officer involved shooting that it was a suicide by cop clearly and the, the kid wanted to die he was like 20 but um you know when you look at his stuff it's like man you know he he wasn't properly trained a lot of his tra he's got 28 years in law enforcement but a lot of his training has been online and he didn't have cit training and it's like 
just tech like that is not something that we would have done. When you look at the video, it's like just heartbreaking because it's like, man, that could have went so much different, but it really is a training issue. And so we have to be willing to accept our responsibility of this problem, you know, and it's like any relationship, you know, you're hundred percent responsible for your 50%. And so yes, law enforcement needs to own their part, but also the community needs to own their part. And if there's something that they can do as a community, like, understanding the the resources, understanding what's available to them uh, so that maybe they can go a different route, like calling cahoots or figuring out what programs are available, then I think that's where you're going to really um, have the best benefit, really. Because again, it, it really is about access to care and just human beings feeling safe that they can make a call when they're in crisis. And it's sad to realize that some people do not. Like it's just, you know, it's like you forget that you're in the uh, America, land of the free, and it's like, well, maybe not. <laughs> it's terrible. So anyway, I'm relieved of my king duties. <laughs> I know it was a heavy burden. Thank you <laughs> both so much. This has been a really um, educational um, session for me. Uh, I wanted to go, if for folks who haven't seen Ernie and Joe, uh, Crisis Cops, please watch it. I think my favorite scene is at the very end of the movie and Joe, you're rocking out and you say, I just can't wait to get out and make a difference today. You're listening to some head banger music or something. And I see that in both of you. And I wish I could clone you guys like a million times and send you all over this earth. But um, we're going to learn a lot from what you've said today. And I really appreciate your time being here. And for everyone who's listening, aren't we lucky to have heard this? So thank you all for joining us and um, giving us your lessons learned. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been yeah, fun. It was great talking with you, Tim, as well. Yeah, likewise, Joe. I know. We want to replicate both your programs. <laughs> okay. Hey, real quick on that movie. So yes. we're actually up for two Emmys. We find out tomorrow Ooh. night. So tomorrow night is the Emmys. And so uh, it's up for best editing and then social issues uh, documentary. So if it wins one of those, it'll be awesome just because it'll create more awareness. Really awesome. It's a I've good conversation starter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you Thank both you so much. And thanks everyone for listening in. Thanks.